Great, seeing people trickle in. Hello, welcome everyone. We are going to give things a minute as the attendees come filing in. We want to thank everyone for their time for joining today. Just quick housekeeping for the people who are on right now. The Q&A is enabled, so as we are going through the discussion about the importance of the candidate and recruiter experience, feel free to file your question into the Q&A as well. Also, the chat is enabled for all attendees today. So as we're discussing and you hear points you like or maybe want to have further um, discussion around a certain topic, feel free to throw it in the chat as well. Um, and we'll also share out the both reports that we'll be referencing today, the Canda Expectations Report from Chronify. And then also we have our Recruiter um, Nation Report from Employ. Both pieces have great data that we'll be referencing today. So feel free to follow along with both reports that are in the chat now. Um, yeah, let's just kick it off and dive in. Hello and welcome. My name is Ryan Luger. I run our webinar channel here at Lever Powered by Employ. And I have with me today, Adam, Josh, and Jake, some experts in the field. So want to go around and just do a quick introduction for everybody. We'll start with Adam. Kick things off for us. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Adam Bird, I'm CEO and co-founder of Chronify. Uh, now, Chronify, for those who don't know, power the scheduling of well over 70 different applicant tracking systems in the industry. Uh, so I've been a, you know, a technologist working with APIs for a long time. We built this infrastructure that really allowed us to work with more product teams, scheduling more interviews than pretty much anyone else. And it's given a real insight into the kind of the, the, the challenges and vagaries of, and the wonderful and terrible aspects of recruitment scheduling. Cause wonderful, cause it's super important and super valuable, terrible because everyone does it in a different way. <laughs> and so really I spend my time working with, 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 with teams and learning and making sure we can fast track that, that process. Yeah, and we did mention earlier, oh, we're sharing our favorites, go-to snacks as well. So oh. go-to snack and chat, feel free to chime in as well as we go. <laughs> okay, yeah, so everyone knows British cuisine is the best in the world. Uh, I kind of blew uh, the minds of our, our Dutch our Dutch team by sharing uh, spaghetti hoops on toast, which I think are sp SpaghettiOs, I think you were saying, Josh, um, <laughs> which is, is the king of snacks, especially on a, on a cold autumn autumn day. Great, thank you, Adam. Josh? Hello, and thank you, Ryan. Um, I'm Josh Jones, everyone, and I lead talent acquisition here at Employ. Um, Employ is made up of Jazz HR, Lever, Jobbyte, and Next Thing RPO. And we service, or we actually provide technology, technology solutions for companies of any and every size, as well as um, some services on top of those through Next Thing. Uh, my background, I've been in, I've been with Employ or an employee branded company for four years now. I think my four-year anniversary is at the end of this month. And I've been in TA for about 11, 12 years now, somewhere in that range. Um, and I've worked you know, in the agency side in executive search. And then the last six or seven years have all been spent in corporate um, talent acquisition. So thank you for having me today. And favorite snacks, if, um, if I have them around, they don't last very long, and that would be sour gummy worms. I, I'm addicted to them, and uh, I always try not to have them because when I do have them, I eat them way too fast. <laughs> it's a strong one. Yeah, I love it. <clears throat> hey, everyone. My name is Jake Paul. Uh, I'm also a recruiter by trade. Um, I started my career as a tech recruiter in the staffing world. Uh, and then eventually moved in-house where I led a number of high growth recruiting teams, um, typically with tech startups. Uh, and about seven years ago, I founded a hiring analytics product called TalentWall. Uh, and last year we got acquired by Crosscheck, which is a hiring intelligence platform where I now work as the chief product officer. Um, favorite snack, probably peanut M&Ms. Um, I go into the office once every week and there's a giant bucket of them there. So I, I limit my consumption to, to Wednesdays. So. Yeah, I feel like the common theme is sweet tooth, not to go against the uh, <laughs> spaghettios on toast, but I feel like my go-tos are always like the, the snacks, the quick nibble of the the sugar candy. It's like an M&M &M bowl that's like in the kitchen counter that is dangerous for me because you can never have one and you can never stop. So always yeah. dangerous. And again, before we dive in, remember chat is enabled, Q&A is enabled. So let's dive into the how to improve the recruiter candidate experience. The great thing is we have these two great reports. Um, and we're going to focus today on speed of the process, automation and AI, expectations, employer branding, 
and then the mental state going forward into 2024. So fun piece of data here, according to the Canada Expectations Report, 49% of candidates left the process when it took too long to schedule an interview compared to just 38 from last year. So that number, significant jump, going up 11% year over year. On the flip side, the Recruiter Nation report revealed that recruiters having too many candidates and the hiring process taking too long were some of their biggest challenges, while also strongly valuing hiring a high-quality candidate. So and you're going to see this a lot today. There's going to be two pieces of data that very conflict each other. So the question here is, do we see the drop-off rate growing after next year with both of these challenges? And then how can the recruiter balance this stress to provide a good candidate experience while also trying to move fast and get a high quality candidate in the door? So two-parter here, but we'll kick it off to Adam and then we'll kind of let the discussion flow. Thank you, Ryan. Yes, on the face of it, it's, you've got kind of one cohort of people who are feeling underserved and another cohort of people are desperately trying to serve them, but feeling overwhelmed. And we're in 2023 and we're not using technology to solve that problem. That, that for me is and another thing that came out of the candidate expectation report. So this is a report we run every, every year we're in our third year. So as you see, we're starting to see the trends here is there's increasing demand and expectation from candidates that technology is used as part of the process. Automation is used wherever possible because for me, what we're seeing is their expectations have changed. You know, I can get a pizza to my house with full tracking in 15 minutes but i then get ghosted by and as far as i'm concerned get ghosted by an employer because the other side of this was that the, the the responsiveness being the most important part of the hiring process as well so 56 percent of candidates in the us for example said responsiveness was the single most important part of the the process and we're not just talking about an autoresponder thanks for your application it's that first connection from a recruiter but the problem is as your report i i i, I, I identifies recruiters are overwhelmed so how do we square that and i think yeah fundamentally it's going it will be solved through proper application of technology candidates want it recruiters want it again that was another theme from your report as well that recruiters were looking to use technology to solve these problems there's lots of promise of ai but there's lots of promise of existing technology highly proven technology to solve these kind of problems so yeah from our perspective and certainly our what our clients are seeing you you save time by automating things so you can have more of a human touch. And so the candidate feels more special. And this is something certainly we see in a lot of markets that the human touch is more important, but that doesn't necessarily mean the recruiter needs to spend more time. They just need to be smarter with their time. Yeah. And you nailed it right there with that last that last phrase, I think, too, just in, you know, making sure that recruiters are spending time on the right things. And that candidate experience is truly you know one of the most important things that we can provide to candidates is a, a positive candidate experience. So if my recruiting team is not you know looking through unqualified resumes all day and we can use something like AI that can help you know identify good resumes out of that stack and we can get to those candidates faster and get them scheduled faster and get them hired faster. It's, uh, it just provides for that better candidate experience and that, you know, the recruiters aren't spinning their wheels with candidates that aren't going to to flush out, you know, anyway. Um, I think that's the, the other thing in technology is completely right in how you solve kind of both of these issues from, from both sides, right? Um, there's lots of tools out there that, you know, help help with scheduling and help with, you know, getting back to candidates faster today than, you know, what we had when, when I started recruiting, um, you know, tools like that. And then, as I said, some of the tools that are just inherent, you know, the technology and uh, today, um, you know, things like AI that's being built into, you know, different applicant tracking systems, um, you know, just kind of helps sort through those candidates uh, a little bit faster. So the technology definitely does solve that on, on both sides. I think there's an yeah. aspect here. Sorry, but they no, no, a lot of a lot of recruiters are judged around time to hire. But there are so many dead times in the process. There is that time between that kind of initial contact. So to say using using kind of AI to, to to identify the key CVs and get in touch with those candidates should be immediate. Oh, fantastic! Glad you applied. Let's get you into the process. Scheduling an interview. It, we, customers arrive to us with like normally it takes three to six days that's their that's their kind of average for scheduling an interview whereas if you can apply into scheduling technology it can get that down to two hours 
Now, those three to six days are complete dead time in the hiring process. You times that by three in terms of three interviews in a, in a process. Suddenly, you can reduce your, your time to hire by two weeks just by scheduling interviews quickly and just by applying those tools. Sorry, Jay, come over to you. Oh, good. Good point. And I, I share the same sentiment as, as um, um, what's already been described here. But for me, it's 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 also kind of clear what's happening. Um, you know, we're in a, I would argue we're currently still in an employer's market versus a candidate's market, right? There's more jobs, than, or sorry, there's more candidates, qualified candidates out there than there are jobs, um, sort of as that pendulum sort of historically swings back and forth. Um I think we're in the in, in an employer's market. And so that data point is super interesting because <clears throat> that's kind of counterintuitive, right? Where when you have the employer that is in the position of leverage and still seeing increased drop-off rates where the candidate is choosing to leave the process, that shows that there's a problem. And to me, that's just you know a big signal that um, candidates are fed up. They've been interviewing for a long time. They're fed up and they're exhausted with inefficient processes. And so... And I think why this is happening is that you've got all these sort of understaffed recruiting teams being asked to hire almost at the same clip as before the sort of big wave of layoffs happened, but with half of the staff and fewer tools due to all the budget cuts. And so now, you know, all of the historical problems that we've seen with recruiting teams in general and in around inefficiencies um, in the recruiting process are getting exacerbated and sort of further exposed with these smaller teams, less tools. So it's even even worse, I would argue. Um, today. And then I guess to the second question, I'd argue that the, you know, that it's more critical now than ever to equip your, similar to what Adam uh, was saying, to equip your recruiters with tools that are heavily focused on efficiency. Um, as efficient recruiting processes tend to breed positive candidate experiences, you know, whether it's automated sourcing to scheduling tools like Chronify, um, to a tool like TalentWall, which is part of Crosscheck, um, which is, you know, sort of purpose built to make recruiters more efficient with their candidate management and their day to day workflow. Um, and so that, ha you know, I'd argue basically that having an efficient efficiency focused tech stack is more important than ever, um, is going to continue to be so for, for, um, time to come. Yeah. And I think like, oh, no, Adam, keep going. I say, I, I think it's what, what's really important and often what's lost in this is actually what you're saying to the candidate by having an inefficient recruiting process. And with lots of stops, you're basically saying either they're not actually that important to you. So if someone turns around to them and deals with them and says they are more important to them, of course, they're going to give them um, a, a, a kind of a more time. But also in terms of what they should expect if they join your organization. This is their kind of their insight into the internal workings of your company. And if it's haphazard, disorganized, uncommunicative, that tells them that you know it, that may not be a fair representation of the, the way the way the company is, but that's their only reference point, it, and that's the, it's that brand impact of a poor recruiting process. Yeah, yeah. recruiting is the face of face of the company, and so they, to your point, they're they're going to assume that everything else operates similarly to their experience with the recruiting process, whether true or not. Um, but I'd argue, from a more optimistic standpoint, that's the opportunity that recruiters have. Um, to create a great employer brand, especially if they're not really well known. It's like if you lead with, you know, efficiency and, and communication and transparency, that's going to go a long way, even if you're a company that I know I'm sort of skipping to the a future question here, but um, right. But that's going to go a much longer way, even if you don't have that employer brand, if you're a new early stage startup or whatever, um, it, it speaks volumes to, you know, to being able to close the candidate and get them all the way through. Yeah, y'all are doing my job for me. You're teasing all the future questions. This is easy because I think what I've been hearing a lot is with this drop off rate increasing year over year, it's not just one thing. It's either maybe it's the process, maybe it's where technology is being used, maybe it's where it's not being used. And at the end of the day, it's all connected and we'll eventually get back to employer brand where that first impression is a lasting impression. Um and I think that just rings true, just when that focus is set on speed and you know, helping move that drop off rate, hopefully not hit over 50% because it's flirting with it at 49% uh, according to the data we have. And then ties right into, you know, thinking about automation and AI, obviously any webinar you go on, any blog post you read, any podcast you listen to, AI is mentioned in one way or another. But what's really interesting is that, um, I believe it's in the Canada Expectations Report, is um, there's still that strong desire for a human touch throughout that process. 
while in the same breath, 62% of candidates would prefer an automated system that manages that interview process, going back to the speed we just recently talked about. So as we look forward into next year, maybe keeping drop-off rate in mind, but not fully, um, I guess, how do we balance that need for speed with that need for human touch? And then where in the process should we leverage this technology? And then where should we then leverage that touch? So um, I'll direct this one to Josh, and then you know we'll just take it around. Yeah, this is, I chuckled a little bit when you started to ask that, because this is something I've always talked about. And I feel like you know, working for a company that's focused on recruitment technology, it's a pretty unique position to be in and leading you know, talent acquisition in that space. Um, but in spite of that, in spite of the fact that you know, I work for a company that puts out all of these awesome you know, technology products that make recruiters' lives easier, um, I've always said that there's you know, that, that element of human touch is something that just won't be lost in recruiting. Um, so I, I love the way you phrase that question. I think there are opportunities at pretty much every step in the process to find some efficiencies, whether it be, you know, from, you know, in that initial, you know, outreach and, and sourcing. I know there's, you know, some great tools out there and automation um, built in from, you know, from a sourcing perspective through, you know, interview scheduling, um, you know, a lot of automated tools that help with the interview scheduling. Um, same thing with like collecting feedback, you know, and within our tools, we've got some, you know, reminders that get sent out to hiring managers um, that help kind of push that urgency. So th I think those touches of automation can be built in throughout the process. Uh, I think where it's important to not only have that human touch, but make sure it's maintained and kind of starts to grow a little bit as the further you get in that in the process, right? So maybe have, you know, much more human elements built into your automation if you can. Um, for you know a rejection for somebody that's been through four interviews versus somebody that's only been through one, those messages should be different, right? They should feel different. I think you can still use that technology and automation and still have that human touch um, by positioning those messages the correct way, and that's a good way to, um, to to balance that too. I think is you know finding those areas of opportunity where you can use that automation but still you know still maintain that human touch and where if I reject somebody that's been all the way through the interview process, it's going to be the same rejection email that I would send you know, to another person. There's an area for me to you know automate some stuff in there and, and input some some details in there that give it that human touch, but it's not adding anything extra to you know to my plate or my team's plate, you know, quite frankly. That's great. Um, yeah, Jacob. Yeah, forward. yeah. I think um honestly, I think candidates care less about like their true time to hire. Um, and, and really what they care about is time to certainty, right? They just want to know what is next, when is next. And if those things are covered, then, then it's fine. Right. I think there's a world where, where you might have, um, where you could have a too fast time to hire, right. I'm talking like under two weeks or something, right. Recruiters or candidates need to sit on a roll, breathe it, learn more about it, explore all of their options that are out there. Um, so there's a, there's sort of a fine line with what is the right time to hire, but I think, you know, again, back to my point about the tools that help recruiters automate tasks and manage their candidates more efficiently. Generally, the more on top of their candidate pipeline that they are, the more the time that recruiters have to Adam's earlier point, um, to just focus on providing a great candidate experience by way of more touch points, more transparent communication, and just generally more efficient processes overall. Um, to your AI question, I think for me, the the three kind of buckets of where humans need to be involved are you know um conducting the actual interviews obviously answering questions you know deep questions about the company there will be some ai automated around what's your org structure and you know things like that where there'll be a chat bot around all the things about the company um but then also third um just making the final hiring decision and so outside of those three buckets I think anything can and will be automated um, as far as it comes to sort of the logistical components of, of the recruiting process. Yeah, I, th I, I, I agree. I think what I like about the way you're uh, just describing the use of AI and use of tooling is to augment the decision-making process. And that's absolutely the point. You know, recruiters, in my experience, are people, people that they don't get into recruitment to do admin. They, they they get into recruitment because they actually want to see people succeed in their roles and be part of their kind of part of their journey and their and, and their story, and we should always be looking to use technology to augment that rather than replace that. And what we see is 
candidates, like I said, as I was saying earlier, they expect it. You know, almost two thirds of candidates expect that process to happen. They understand the practicalities of dealing with lots of candidates. They understand roles are competitive. So, but if you as an employer can deploy that technology uh, effectively, then that 50% that leave because it takes too long, they'll be yours because you've given them that human touch quickly and you get to choose from that that sort of 50% of people who actually no one else is interested in and just waited around for the uh, that interview to be scheduled. If you kind of want to be quite harsh and harsh about it, this is your opportunity to get that top slice, the best candidates, just by streamlining that process, getting them into process and, and being uh, human with them. No, that's great. And then before we go too far, we had a great question in the Q&A pop up that I think would be perfect to address here is someone asked, how do you deal, this is the third person involved we haven't talked about yet, is the hiring manager. So the, the candidate wants to go through the process quickly. The, the recruiter wants to get that position filled quickly. But sometimes you don't deal, with, sometimes you deal with the hiring manager is not responsive. So they ask, how do you deal with the hiring manager having no sense of urgency to move things forward in the recruiting process? Um, take a beat and think on it. I guess I'll direct this one starting at Josh, then we can work our way around or whoever wants to take it first, because I think this is an interesting component that sometimes gets lost when we think recruiter experience and candidate experience is that there is that hiring manager and there's somewhere who might either be helping or not helping. So um, I guess whoever wants to chime in first, go for it. So I think that's a great question to to add to get that full round on this. I think it goes back to expectation setting. You know, um, you know, I I try to empower the recruiters on my team to you know make sure that they hold hiring managers accountable, and um, a part of that is like setting those expectations with that hiring manager up front on the front end. Um, but on top of that, you know, with the technologies that we use, the tools that we use, we've got these annoying reminders that I can click and my team can click, and then I can go send one, and and then you know if I, if I start going to shake leaves and ask questions. I mean, you know, managers are all busy too, right? Um, so I think, you know, we have to, to understand that, but um, they also need to understand these statistics that we're seeing. Like these are real stats about, you know, um, candidates falling off because of, you know, time and, and time to fill. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure we've all seen, you know, awesome candidates get snatched up, you know, during uh, one of our interview processes. I mean, it, it happens to, to everyone. So, um, I think it's just getting that hiring manager, hiring manager to kind of understand that and and make sure that um, you know that expect expectation set on the front end. That way, you're not having to chase things down on the back end. And um, a lot of that's like through you know enablement and and training those teams on the front end. Yeah, Josh kind of shared exactly my thoughts: data and expectation setting. Um, you know, setting up initial SLAs for time to submit scorecards, things like that. Um, and then, you know, all, all the data that you're describing around drop-off rates, showing them how many candidates it truly takes to get to a hire and how hard this job really is. Um, you know, one of my, one of my favorites, favorite charts that we have within the talent wall analytics platform is, uh, outstanding scorecards. We call it the shame list because <laughs> we, we get, you know, recruiting teams will share it with the broad, you know, hiring manager, um, sort of stakeholders. And nobody wants to be that top person with 15 outstanding scorecards. And so things like that, um, which ultimately is sort of um, transparency around the data, it, it really helps drive that as well. I, I think I, I can talk specifically to the interview scheduling process because we see this a lot, that kind of the hiring manager is the one that's actually doing the interview. And the conventional way, especially when you get to multi-person interviews, is lots of back and forth. So it's like, what times are you free? I'll go and ask the candidate what times they're free. And then by the time you've asked the candidate what times they're free, that person's not free. The half-life of that information is vanishingly small. Mm -hmm. And so naturally, hiring managers are going to get exasperated because it's just, this is just, and so all they're talking about with the, with the recruiter is admin, back and forth. Oh, now we want to reschedule because so-and-so can't do it. If you can automate that entire process, which is what we do, then suddenly there is no back and forth. There are times that you can either set aside, you know, convince the hiring manager to set aside times for interview, block them out in the calendar. You know, as long as the scheduling tool can work with that, you can then just offer those to the candidate, safe in the knowledge that the candidate, you know the hiring manager is going to be available and you don't waste their time. They just get interviews in their calendar at times they've agreed with you that they can do. That's it. 
And that starts to build that relationship where the hiring manager knows it's not it's not a pain when recruitment are contacting them. This is actually, I've got a candidate for you. I've done my, my job. It's in your calendar. Now, There's I've taken that, that load off you. So I think there's a lot we can do there to really improve the back and forth of hiring managers and show them that kind of kind of recruit, recruitment is on their side, along with obviously the data you're talking about. But I think there's that kind of practical lived experience, which is something that, that can be solved and help with that relationship. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I experienced it firsthand as a recruiter, right? I had, I remember having 20 plus roles open, almost 100 active engaged candidates post phone screen. And that to-do list on your plate just gets longer and longer. And combined with, you know, five, seven, eight, ten 10 phone screens a day sometimes. And it's like, you can go three, four days before you even get to scheduling. Cause you know that when you sit down and try to schedule that interview, you might be looking at a 30 minute, you know, process just to find a, you know, hiring manager one on or hiring manager screen, much less than onsite. So um, again, automating anything like that is just, you know, I would argue mission critical to, um, being an efficient recruiting org. And that, that perfectly leads to kind of the next question I was going to ask is all about expectations. Um, think in future state here, but this past year, you know, about on average across segments, recruiter state takes about 47 and a half days to fill a job opening. Then again, like we talked about before, on the flip side of that coin, there's four percent of candidates expect an interview to be scheduled in less than a week. You know, Adam, you referenced earlier about that two to six day time window is when they expect to get that schedule. And then going back to the first data we had of the drop-off rate increasing. So again, it feels like we're being pulled all these different directions with the data. So, you know, Jake, you know, points one of you, with like new AI tools coming out left and right again, all over, you know, how do we see these expectations changing the velocity of the hiring process in 2024? And then that would then impact, hopefully that drop-off rate to decrease and also the data fill decreasing as well. So, yeah, um, yeah. For for me, this again sort of goes back to what I was saying about time to certainty. Again, they, it's it's less about the total time to hire. Obviously, if you're at 47 days, that's a long time to be in process. I think the sweet spot's probably 20 to 30 days. But ultimately, as long as candidates know what is the next step and when is it happening, if there is a next step, um, then they're in a good place, right? And they can better manage their own job search. They can you know, try to line things up for where they, you know, in a perfect world, have two, three, four offers at the end, all in the same sort of time frame. Um, but yeah, and then what I'd also just say is that you can automate virtually any part of the process you want at this point. But at the end of the day, you're still dealing with humans who have busy schedules. And as long as humans are still doing the interviews and making the hiring decisions, um, a thoughtful and strategic interview process is still going to sort of take time to to get through, despite what you automate. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I, I agree with Jake 100% there. Uh, you know, it's kind of, I said earlier, I think there's going to be efficiencies that we can find everywhere in the process to, um, you know, to kind of streamline that process and hopefully continue to see those, you know, time to hire numbers trend down. Um, but if we do that in a, you know, thoughtful way and using that technology and, you know, maximizing, you know, that human element of it, um, I think that's going to be a, you know, a, a positive, you know, blend of that's, you know, human touch and, automation to, to get somebody through the, the process. Um, I think that the, the candidate experience can be, you know, very stressful. And then as, as Jake alluded to there, I think the more of that stress we can get rid of on the front end um, by again, laying out the timeline, I think in our, um, in the response email to an application that we've got set up, it kind of lays out what our interview process is right there. So as soon as they apply, they can kind of see what, you know, what the process looks like that they're about to go through. Um, and I've had a lot of candidates over the last few years that you know, followed up and reached out and just really appreciated just a, a small touch like that. So, uh, again, I think that goes back to expectation setting with the candidates and, um, you know, having that little bit of, you know, human element on the front end, but uh, maintaining that throughout and, and utilizing, you know, technology where we can, uh, whether it's in, you know, even throughout the interview process and having like a solid defined process, that's going to help that candidate experience, right? If you have somebody, if you have three different people interviewing this candidate and all three of those people are going in with the same questions, um, very repetitive interviews, you know, each each time the tell me about yourself, um, the candidate's not learning anything and we're not learning anything about that candidate. So having mm -hmm. that process structured on the front end, well, it helps with that candidate experience too. 
um, the questions that they're getting asked, you know, they can learn a lot from that and that will spark more questions from them. Um, so it's just a much more positive experience when you have a, you know, a good defined process as well as, um, you know, have that good mix of, of technology and uh, human touch. Yeah, and, and the data that we have really backs up Jake's point. So back in 2021, about 25% of candidates said lack of communication was the most frustra frustrating part of the recruitment process. That's now a 41%. So it's like 25, 36, 41% now. Um, and it, and it's that, it's funny, I, I did a, a panel discussion with a, a another kind of uh, a talent expert, and she'd done some research around the kind of relationship with stress and cortisol levels. And that lack of communication was driving stress reactions in candidates that's what it was they were they were they were actually being kind of mentally affected and physically affected by the process by that lack of uncertainty and so uncertainty is so important to the process now, and if i sort of switch hats and put my employer hat on mm -hmm. one of the single most transformative things we, we did in our in our hiring process was just publish our interview process for everyone, just put it all online so people could just read it, see that process, every, all that questions up there. So much more engagement from the candidates. They were kind of far more, they came into the process far more uh, appreciative of what we were trying to achieve and why we were trying to achieve it and, and and arrived more prepared as well. And so I think that the idea around the company displaying this is how we do things make gives the candidate reason to kind of buy into the process themselves and, and give a, a better account of themselves and invest that time in making sure that they are presenting themselves best and uh, uh, the best approach to that, that to that that role yeah it's pretty amazing how such a small thing like that to josh's point just having that automated you know email response just laying out the process how much that fundamentally impacts the the state of the of the candidate their you know engagement in the process going forward and i think it just shows how far we have to go frankly and how much room there is for improvement um broadly and as think, a yeah and i think this is the point we can get distracted by the shiny but actually we should just remember there are some really fundamental basics we can do that really transform the experience for the candidate and put us in a better position as a, as an employer to have our pick of the best candidates yeah, absolutely. And then we had got another great question just popped in uh, that ties back into it, because I think we've talked a lot about speed and, and more efficient processes and, and using the technology while not losing the human touch, which is all great. But at the same time, at the end of the day, we still want a high quality candidate coming through the door and starting day one. So we got a great question that just came in is how do you balance that thin line between time to hire and quality of hire? Then as well the retention right there so I'll, whoever wants to dive in first go ahead but i think that's another great point to think about as we talk about speed and, and processes and efficiencies um quality of hire is interesting to me because it's something i've been very interested in measuring and we're um you using one of our other internal tools uh, to start to look at that a little bit more and hopefully over the next year as i get more data in there i'll be able to to kind of track that a little bit more um, but my my initial thought on that is balancing balancing is just kind of reverse engineering it a bit. Um, if we have you know certain areas of the business where we're seeing a lot of attrition, um, you know maybe we can start focusing in there. Is it you know interview teams? Is it you know something specific or is it a specific uh, recruiter? Um, that's yeah. And I think just by looking at the data around that, we could probably you know kind of figure out where the problems you know lie in that. Um, if if we you know if you have a recruiter that's you know, putting people all throughout the organization and they're just falling off left and right. Um, I would tend to think that that's going to be, you know, something on the recruiter side. If it's, you know, one very specific pocket of business and there's you know, maybe more than one recruiter feeding into that, um, you know, I would say it's maybe the interview teams that's, you know, not asking the right questions or really digging in there. So I would say it's kind of looking at your, uh, the, the process um, that you've got set up and and making reverse engineering, engineering it if you are seeing those, you know, issues on the on the back end. Um, I think the problem with any metric is you kind of get what you measure. And I'll be honest, I'm not a huge fan of time to hire because I think it can promote the wrong kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. I think there's interesting things like measuring dead time in the interview process where things are just not happening. There's 
time since last human communication with the candidate. I think those kind of things are really interesting. But I think it's going a level deeper and understanding kind of what is because what is actually the kind of candidate's experience through the process. Because frankly, I'll happily wait six months for the right candidate with some roles, a year even, you know, the, almost the quality of hire. And I think this came out in your research is the single most important thing. It's mm -hmm. so expensive for us to have, not retain that person because they were a, a bad fit. The interview process didn't do its job because we rushed it because we were trying to hit this kind of mythical time to hire number. And there was some, some, some great value in hitting that number. No, no, this is all about getting great candidates through the door. So I try and avoid time to hire if I can possibly do that and think more about other other more um, metrics that allow me to assess the quality of the, the candidate experience in the interview process. I still look at time to hire um, as a more general measurement. I like looking at it against benchmarks and um, mm -hmm. just seeing that our team's uh, working efficiently still. Very competitive person in that way. Um, but one thing that, as you said that, um, one thing that we've looked a lot closer at is that pipeline speed, right? Like how much time is that candidate spending in each each stage of the process? And are there bottlenecks in there that are impacting the candidate experience? So uh, that's that's something I've, I've looked at a lot more closely over the past year and a half than than I have uh, previously. Yeah, and I, I don't think you have to give on one to get the other. Like, I think you can optimize for both, um, you know, Quality of hire is our sort of bread and butter where we help companies um, effectively connect outcome data, you know, tenure and performance back with the recruiting programs and processes. So the first step is just to identify what is our quality of hire? How does it vary across different sort of um, departments and organizations uh, within the business? But then it's like when you when you identify that you have a problem, to your point, Josh, I think there, there's a lot of different buckets of where you need to figure out where did this go south? Um, right. All the way back from the source of the candidate, you might have a source that just for whatever reason breeds quick quits or, you know, high turnover rates or what what have you to the interview process and the candidate experience um, to the hiring decision, to the onboarding experience, all the way to the manager. And so it's a pretty nuanced um, thing to unpack, but at least you have to start with measuring it so you know where to go and sort of do do that unpacking. Um and then the whole the whole idea is just to operationalize it. So it's not it's one thing just to measure it, but sort of the next step after that is like baking that into your recruiting programs and processes, like optimizing for source. So for this type of role, what are our best sources? What kind of ROI am I getting off of my sourcing spend? Um, you know, being able to quickly identify where you know where should we go? Should we use an agency for this source? If as we're balancing like speed versus quality. Um, all that stuff gets really sort of unlocked once you start to actually just measure it. Um, cause really it's what we always say is it's about progress over perfection. You got to start somewhere and then you use that data to start, you know, informing your, your pre-hire, um, practices. No, that's also great. And I think what sometimes gets lost in all this is that, you know, we talk about technology and process, but we're dealing with humans, you know, both sides, like. The recruiter themselves, like they deal with their own stress. The candidate is dealing with their own stress in this process as well, both trying to achieve a common goal in a way. And one of the data points that I found the most fascinating between the two reports is the drastic differences in the stress levels of both people are feeling. Um, according to the Recruiter Nation report we ran, 86% of HR decision makers are feeling optimistic for the future. <laughs> Where on the other side, 46% of candidates saying that the delayed interview scheduling has affected anxiety levels compared to 30% of last year. That, you know, Adam, you touched on this data point earlier, and I was excited for this question because these are so polar opposite, where you have the recruiter who are feeling optimistic with the technology that they have, where the candidates are getting more and more stressed along the way. So with this disconnect being in the hiring process, you know, why do you think we're seeing this disconnect of the emotional pull of each person, then how can we use technology to help bridge this gap to help reduce the stress of the candidate while continuing the, you know, the HR decision makers to feeling uh, optimistic for the future. And then, you know, this second question here is just, you know, what are your expectations going forward in 2024? Do you see it being optimistic or do you see it continue being stressful for the candidate? So a lot to unpack there. I know, uh, Adam, you know, I'll kick it over to you first. Cause I know, you hit on the the anxiety level of the candidate before. Uh, I, I think we have to remember that recruiters not going to lose their job if a candidate doesn't get picked. 
but a candidate that this could this this is this is the next stage in their career this is the choice between them uh, well it could be yeah it's a significant and incredibly stressful what changing a job moving house and getting married there are the three most i want kids yes yes i i've I part i've moved to erase kids from my brain they're so stressful but you, you, you know what i mean they, these a new job a new career is the one of the most stressful things we do as humans and so it's completely natural that candidates are going to feel very stressed about this process mm-hmm. and it's also i think you know recruit uh, hr decision makers of course they're, they're optimistic because they, they are they're seeing the opportunity to improve processes they can sort of draw lines and see that if i can improve things then i can i can meet my own business goals and sort of keep my job almost mm-hmm. so but i think there's a there's an opportunity there's back to recruiters being people people and kind of understanding that candidates are people too but they're in a very very different position so it's only right that recruiters should be able to give them that's why candidates value the human touch so much mm-hmm. it's because they they they're feeling valued right. and i think that what's interesting about this kind of measuring the kind of retention rates the quality of hire my hope is that that becomes more um because it's harder to measure it's measured less and so you might be measuring on time to hire you might be measuring on these things because they're easy numbers to track and therefore hr leaders are managed on those on 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 those things but actually back to our point around it's the quality of the hire that actually should trump everything we need to see more application of intelligence and data around the quality of the hires we're making so then hr leaders are held to account around the decisions their teams are making and part of that will inevitably require you to respect the candidate more yeah and i'd say i'd add to that on the quality of hire front um it's again one thing to measure it but you have to once you start to measure it and, and identify sort of what are the you know general sort of broad profiles of your top performers your middle performers and your bottom performers then you need to go start to unpack that again to bake it into how you're analyzing and interviewing the candidates. So you have much more data around what you know generally makes up a you know, top, form, top performing employee at this particular company. Um, you're never going to find a magic profile of like, we just need to go hire a bunch of these, but you, you can at least get directionally accurate with knowing that these are the things that typically correlate um, to top performers. And on the, on the flip side of that, I'd argue really understanding what the profiles are of the bottom performers as well is equally, if not more valuable than you're than trying to hire just nothing but top performers, right? Because you're pouring earlier, Adam, like that cost of a mishire, um, you know, in, in some regards, depending on the role in the company could be much more expensive than even, you know, hiring one or two sort of top performers. So, um, Yeah. Yeah, and just uh, I'll I'll just build on what Adam said there. You know, uh, you know, HR leaders. I've I've got a job. My stressors are way different. I would expect if somebody um, was conducting an interview and asked me you know, questions about my stressors, it would be a little bit different than you know some of the the survey results there. But the folks that are looking for a job, you know, it's a it's a stressful time. You know, whether you are. Um, most people are looking for a role. Most people are looking for a role out of necessity. Um, which can be extremely stressful. So um, I would say wherever we can make that easier for them. And we've talked about all of this, I think, but throughout the entire interview process, like we can take those stresses away by, you know, being communicative up front, right? Setting expectations, laying out the timeline for them, um, remaining in contact, even if it's, you know, maybe we have somebody out or our entire ELTs here today for an offsite. Um, so if I'm waiting on feedback, I'm not going to get it today or, or tomorrow. Um, but in that instance, you know, I know as a recruiter, I need to reach out to that person, just give them a, you know, a quick, you know, um, heads up saying, Hey, leadership's meeting, um, hope to have something back by tomorrow. So I think it's the, the combination and the theme of what we've been talking about is, you know, how we can interview or intertwine the human touches in with the technologies we're using to, to be more efficient. I think that helps kind of, you know, keep the candidates at ease. They're seeing a process that's flowing smoothly. They're, they're being communicated with and, Oftentimes that helps keep the anxiety down. So I think it's, um, but yeah. That's a, that's a great point. Like I think um, about the sort of 
you know, job searching out of necessity. I think we're probably, I don't have the data, but I would argue that we have more candidates in the applicant in the applicant pool today that are in that boat than two years ago where they're more exploring, looking for a pay raise, but they're they're solid and comfortable and secure in their existing role. And that just um, sort of heightens all of the anxieties that are already natural um, to the uncertainty of the hiring process. Um, and then I would add to that, you know, as far as what are we looking at next year, I think was part of the question. Um, I think, you know, it, it's going to get a little worse before it gets better, in my opinion. I think to my earlier point, like, Teams are trying to get back to hiring at the same clip that they were sort of pre-pandemic, pre-layoff, you know, waves, things like that. Um, but they're still operating with half the headcount, with not all the tools that they originally had. And so what's probably going to happen is I I think in Q1, Q2, we're going to see missed hiring plans and decreased candidate, candidate experience, candidate MPS, because, you know, for whatever reason, recruiting is always the most reactive, you know, from a business leadership's perspective not from us as recruiters but like we're the bottom of the totem pole in most organizations and the budgets hit us last and it's like oh okay wait a minute you're you're showing me some data now that we've actually just failed the last two quarters now you can have the budget um so i think it's going to be you know sort of mid middle of next year before those budgets get unlocked when the reality hits that they just don't have the tools or the team to to make the hires that they want um and specifically for cross check we you know little plug here but we rolled out a suite of survey technology for people teams. So both on the pre-hire and post-hire side. And so we're going to be able to track across our customers, my hypothesis of how is candidate MPS broadly as an industry um, going to get impacted by, you know, over the next um, few quarters. So. No, great. And unfortunately we're, we're hitting time, but I want to, have to save time for one more question. Adam, Josh, Jake, thanks so much for the time. Everyone has been here. Thank you for all the questions. I just want to end off with some key takeaways going into next year and how we see that improvement happening to the recruiter can experience, because obviously based on today's conversation, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, one of my favorite takeaways from the reports for the recruiter nation one was just like that focus on the technology and process prioritization. So you know, Adam, you've alluded to this during the conversation today is using technology to take away those repetitive mundane tasks to the folks in the human touch. And then one of my favorite takeaways from the, the Canada report is Canada's just want to be seen as an individual, you know, not just another person on the screen or a metric, but be treated as a human through the process. You know, we've talked stress all day. So, you know, we'll start with Adam and we'll go around, but I'd love to hear everyone's just key takeaways going into next year and then we'll wrap up. I, th I think to Jake's point, the hiring is going to start to ramp up and expectations are going to start to ramp up. Mm -hmm. And the winners in that process will be those that recognize that they need to start optimizing and harnessing technology that's available. Everything's available. There's nothing There's nothing <laughs> new out there that is going to solve any of the problems that we've talked about today. It's about doing the basics. And I think, and deploying technology effectively so you can, you, know, you can do more with less. And technology should allow you to do that. But that time you're freeing up can be spent being human with the most important the most valuable candidates and that will allow your organization to move faster hire faster and be more successful than all of your competitors so that's yeah there'll be winners and losers but the winners will be the ones that act act most quickly yeah and for, for me i guess everything that we're talking about is sort of a subcategory of this sort of eternal journey of recruiting orgs um, trying to become more and more of a strategic partner to the business. And until that happens, to my point about where we are on the totem pole, like, you know, the budgets will not proactively get unlocked when they see the hiring ahead of them. They're going to wait until, you know, things fail before they, before they open things up and, you know, from a both tool and headcount perspective. So um to me, that's the sort of North Star objective in, in next year and beyond is just individual organizations, recruiting orgs, becoming more and more closer with the business and being perceived and um, thought of as a strategic partner. And for me, I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time just around kind of um, thinking, I mean, one of my team's objectives, uh, we set our, our team norms, I should say, um, was to provide the to provide the absolute best candidate experience. So wherever we can find efficiencies to make sure that we're impacting that candidate experience um, is going to be important. Um, you know, for us as employee, 
Um, not a lot of brand recognition there right now. I mean, people know Job Byte, people know Lever, some people know Jazz HR, some people may not know any of those, but know next thing. But as employee, you know, that brand uh, awareness. So um, <clears throat> seeing some of the data through the, the reports around, you know, how candidates, you know, uh, view your brand, uh, it, you know, that can keep somebody from applying to you or not, or you know, make somebody drop out early in the process. So um, kind of tying that all back in together, like, you know, how do we, uh, as an organization kind of, you know, get that brand awareness out there, weave that in with the candidate experience while keeping my small recruiting team, you know, happy and efficient in their roles. Um, and that's, that's kind of the exciting part of the challenge, right? Like that's where I'm looking at different tools that we could potentially bring in to, to find some of those efficiencies. Um, we are constantly looking at, you know, all of our processes and making sure that, you know, where can we improve something here? Um, so it's it, seeing the data just kind of helps me, you know, set that strategy and vision for uh, for my team next year. Oh, fantastic! This is, I mean, the more you all talk, the more I learn. This has been fantastic. We could probably do this for another two hours, I bet, if we wanted to. Adam, Josh, Jake, thank you so much for your time today. Everyone who attended, thank you so much for your time today. We'll share the recording out. We'll share the reports out as well. And if we didn't get to your questions, we apologize, but there will be follow up concluding today's webinar. So. Adam, Josh, Jake, thank you so much again. And thanks everyone for attending and have a great rest of the day. Appreciate it. Yes. I'm going. Thanks. Bye.